this course, I got a little score. Do people get 10 out of 10? Is that a thing that happens? Because it wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get one. Some people get 10 out of 10, yes. <clears throat> Do you need like illustrations, you need figures to get a 10 out of 10? What, what, was, the, what was the standard for the grade, or the grading criteria for the proposal? I, I'm, happy to, I'm happy to go over it with you, so. Oh, you. okay. Um, all right, let's get started. Um, oh, yeah, well, that's what so uh, we were talking about determinants, uh, routings, tilings, things like this. And, um, and so today I wanted to tell you uh, another very interesting part of the story of uh, the connection between tilings and determinants. And I think today I'm not really going to prove anything because I just want to show you some very interesting things that are true. And, uh, yeah, if you're interested in, in reading the proofs, I can tell you where to look. Um, but uh, but yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna start with uh, this tiling that I drew right here. You can tell that I just like drawing these things, and so uh, actually, this is only gonna be go be on, this is only gonna be on the board for a little while. But um, remember that we were studying these plane partitions. which we can loosely define as just being uh, stacks of cubes <coughs> in an n by n by n box or being grabbing, okay? So we discussed it last time. Uh, and so here's an example of a plane partition, but maybe you can see that this is an extremely symmetric example. Actually, no matter, no matter how you turn it around, you get the same thing, okay? Um, and so this is what's called totally symmetric. Okay. And what that means is that you have a group of symmetries acting on the hexagon, right? You have all these reflections, all these rotations. And uh, if you look at applying any, you know, any reflection that fixes the hexagon, any rotation, you're going to see that you always get the same time. So you can imagine that's a very special property. Um, and so this is totally symmetric. So invariant under the action of the Lehedral group <coughs> of symmetries of the hexagon. OK? But there is another symmetry, even, that is not captured by the dihedral group, and it's it's really more of a three-dimensional symmetry. So um, we already talked last time about how when you look at a picture like this, you don't know what's in the front and what's in the back. But if you look at this picture, then no, no matter how you're looking at it, whether whatever is the front and whatever is the back, you get the same picture, which is a very special property. And maybe this will be a little bit clearer if I if I shade some of these things make it look three-dimensional. So maybe I'll shade what I'm going to call the floor. Okay. So maybe this is the floor. This is the ceiling. Um, but now if you, if, if instead of looking at the cubes that are over there, you look at the cubes that are over here, you get the same uh, same picture. Okay? And I know that's hard to see, but, uh, but if you were to take this thing in space and kind of like just put, go like this, it's going to fit right in there and make, make, exact, make up exactly for the negative space in this picture. 
You see that? I I drew this I drew this on the notes. If you want to kind of print it out and, and doodle on it and, and uh, convince yourself of that. But so this is a, this is not a symmetry of the hexagon. This is, this is like I said a three dimensional symmetry, and this is what's called self complementary. So invariant under taking the complement in the box. Okay. So this thing is called a totally symmetric self-complementary plane partition. So it's like boxes in it. M by M by M box. So is it clear what we're what we're talking about here? Okay. Um, so we talked last time about the, the enumeration of uh, these plane partitions without these symmetry conditions, and I, I showed you this very beautiful formula. It was a it was a product of uh, factorials or binomial coefficients, or depending on how we wrote it. Um, but there was this paper of Stanley in the '80s where he looked not only at the, at the plane partitions, but he looked at all the possible symmetries that they could have. So for example, he, he looked, okay, how many are invariant under rotation? And maybe you want to be invariant only under 180 degree rotation. Or maybe you want to be invariant under every possible rotation of the hexagon. Or maybe you want to be invariant under reflection or under complementation, all these different possibilities. And, uh, and so he, he considered all these problems, and he discovered that there are beautiful formulas for almost every one of them. It might be that for every one of them. I can't remember right now. But so he, he wrote this paper called A Baker's Dozen of Conjectures. Uh, of Conjectures Concerning Plane Partitions. Maybe I should explain to the Colombian students what this refers to. So in the US, uh, when you buy a dozen of something, sometimes they give you a, an extra one for free. So Baker's dozen is 13. Okay, so <coughs> he has this paper with 13 really beautiful conjectures. And one of the conjectures that he had was this one, that the number of totally symmetric self-complementary plane partitions of, of, uh, a hexa of a hexagon of size n is equal to this number. One factorial, four factorial, seven factorial, dot, 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 up to three n minus two factorial. Okay, so you jump every three, divided by um, n factorial, n plus one factorial, n plus two factorial, up until two n minus one. Um, so this was a conjecture from 86. And people tried for a while, they couldn't really do it. And there was this, this paper kind of trying to divulge further the conjectures in this paper. <laughs> and I like this quote in here, uh, so I'm going to read it to you. So this is a paper by David Robbins talking about this and other conjectures. And he says, these conjectures are of such compelling simplicity that it is hard to understand how any mathematician can bear the pain of living without understanding why they are true. Um, this guy really devoted a, a, a many years of his research to try to understand these, these, um, uh, these unrelated conjectures. Um, and finally, this was proved. So this was proved in a, in a series of papers. So the first insight was by Doran, who actually was an undergraduate at the time when he did this. And he, he found the lattice path interpretation. And uh, you know, that, that shouldn't be too surprising, given what we did last time, where we saw that you know, there are these lattice paths living in here. Um, but this wasn't the usual uh, application of Gessel, you know, that we that we did last time. It was it was more complicated. Okay. 
um, Stainbridge then uh, used this lattice path interpretation to give some determinantal, form determinantal formula for this number, big determinants. Uh, but he couldn't really prove that that determinant was equal to this number. And then finally, Andrews proved, so he evaluated it in the determinant and completed the proof. So this was, I don't know, uh, late 80s, 90, 94. Uh, Andrews is, is really one of the masters of, of uh, these uh, evaluations of determinants, hypergeometric uh, functions, things like this. And actually, one of the steps of his proof was automated. So there was some identities that he needed to prove. He didn't really know how to prove them, but he knew of this algorithm that I mentioned earlier in the semester, the wilf zeilberger algorithm that proves combinatorial identities. And he really had identities that nobody had proved, nobody could prove, but he just fed them to the, to the algorithm, and the, and the algorithm certified that they were true. Um, and so actually that, that WZ algorithm played a key role in, in proving this, this conjecture. But I should say that, again, you, know, you look at it, and it, it's this very nice multiplicative formula. And at the moment, there is no nice explanation for why it's this nice multiplicative formula. Yeah? How did Stanley? <laughs> how does Stanley get that conjecture? I've always wondered. I've always wondered how he generates these amazing conjectures. Uh, I mean, okay, so I, I think in this case maybe he just did, did, a, did a, enough examples to, to find the pattern. Uh, I mean, the, there are there are other ways of encoding this that are easier than drawing the pictures. It would be very daunting to try to draw all the pictures, but but there are restatements where you can actually carry out the, the, all the examples. And I don't know if he did it by computer or by hand, or I'm not sure. If you ever see him in a, in a conference or in a talk, he's, he's always making little examples of it, of it on his notepad. So he's somebody really good at generating amazing conjectures from small examples. Um, OK, so let me tell you. Now, another part of the story. So like I said, this was, this was a very short-lived life for this picture. I'm going to erase it now. Um, but I'm going to tell you something that's related to, to this stuff. So let's talk about a different combinatorial object. Call it alternating sign matrix. It's a matrix of zeros, ones, and minus ones such that the non-zero entries of any row or column alternate 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1. <coughs> so you have to start with a 1, and you have to end with a 1. Okay. So let's do an example. Maybe we'll do a, a five by five. Okay. So, for example, let, let's let's try to fill out the first row. So, what can I do in the first row? It should be zeros, one, ones, and minus ones. I have to make these guys alternate. Okay. But you see, as soon as I do that, I break the rule for a column, because in a column, the first non-zero entry should be a one. Right. So, if I try to put minus ones in the first row, I'm gonna I'm gonna break it. This is not gonna work. Okay. And so that means that I actually am not able to put any minus ones, which means that I'm only allowed to put one, one, and then the rest zeros, okay, in the first row, okay? So that's going to be my first row. 
Oh, it's a, I should have said it's a square matrix. And by a matrix. Okay. It's going to be a 5 by 5 matrix. Okay, so in the, in the next row, now I'm going to be able to put a minus 1, for example, because, the one, because this column needs to go 1, minus 1, 1, minus 1. I could, for example, put a minus 1 here. Okay? But if I want to have a minus 1 there, then I have to have a 1 to the left and to the right. Okay? So I don't know, let's say that we put it here and here, and you'll see that I'm not able to put any other minus 1s without breaking the rules. Right? And so then I'm forced to put zeros, 0, 0. Okay? And you just continue doing this in whichever way you want. Okay? I did an example here, but of course there's many other ones. Um, okay. And so this is an alternating sign matrix, right? In every row and in every column, the non-zero entries go one, minus one, one, etc. Okay. Um, what is the easiest way of constructing some alternating sign matrices? Actually, every permutation matrix is an alternating sign matrix. Right? In a permutation <coughs> matrix, you have a one in each row and in each column, and so the, these conditions are trivially satisfied. Okay? But it's more interesting if, if, um, if you do have minus ones, then you get more interesting alternating sign matrices. <coughs> so why am I? talking to you about this. The reason that I tell you about this is that there was another conjecture, which was this one. <laughs> it's pretty shocking. Yeah, the, the, the conjecture is that uh, these matrices are enumerated by exactly the same numbers. They look totally different. They look like very different problems. But the answer is the same. Okay. And so this is a conjecture of um, Mills, Robbins, and Rumsey. Mills, Robbins, and Rumsey. This is a conjecture. From 83. Uh, and this is the same Robbins whose paper I was just reading uh, a second ago. And this is not the Robbins from this department. <laughs> um, OK, so this, this conjecture, again, beautiful conjecture and a big, big mystery. So this was open for, for a very long time. Uh, actually, in, in, in this paper, Robbins tells the story of how they had this conjecture and they, they showed it to Stanley. <clears throat> now, nowadays, when we have a sequence of numbers, we feed it into the online encyclopedia of integer sequences, and then we get that thing that searches the whole literature for us. Well, that didn't used to exist, and it used to be that if you had a sequence of integers, often you would ask Stanley. And, uh, <laughs> and he would maybe tell you, oh, that, that looks like something else. Okay, and so he somehow recognized that even though its problems were very, were very different, it seemed like the, the answer was the same. Yeah. How does something become a conjecture? How does something become a conjecture? So I'm actually going to tell you uh, how this conjecture was discovered. But I mean, you know, like, like in the other example that I showed you, the way it becomes a conjecture is that you just enumerate it, n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3. You look for a pattern. And then, uh, yeah, I mean, if, if you start at a, it's like these tests that they make you do as a kid when they give you a list of numbers and they make you guess the next one and you find patterns. This is really how a lot of these conjectures are generated. Um, and I'll show you how these guys discovered alternating sign matrices. And then, like, like we talked about, it's, a, it's an instinct for combinatorialists. Whenever there's a new combinatorial object, we ask how many. And then they computed and they got this number. But they had no idea why this was true. Uh, this was open for over a decade, and this was finally proved by Zeilberger and by Cooperberg in 95. 
I think this was around 90. So actually, it's, it's a very interesting story. And this Zalberger is the same Zalberger from the WZ algorithm. And uh, the story goes that when, when he discovered that um, in the previous proof, his algorithm had played a very important role. And not, not only, I mean, it, it, it wasn't about his algorithm. He really believes very deeply that we, that mathematics should be about making computers prove our theorems. And so when he found that in the previous theorem there was an important automated part, he got excited and he said, oh, you know, this is, this is, I'm good at this. And he decided to go for this conjecture and he managed to prove it. And this was a, I think like 91 or 92, something like that. And it was a paper that was extremely long and relied on computer computation and non-trivial ones. Um, and so it, actually in the community there was a little bit of a controversy about whether this was a proof or not. And uh, he's, he's also, he, he kind of has a reputation for, for being somewhat eccentric. Uh, if you go to his website, you can, you can see why. You know, one thing that he likes to do is co-author papers with his computer. And he just publishes a lot of papers where, oh, you know, it's theorem. And he states the theorem and then proof. And then he'll just say, ask my computer. And this is the certificate that came out. But it's not a joke. I mean, he's, he's, he's really developed this very deeply. Um, but, you know, I think also some mathematicians feel threatened by computers playing such an important role, and some mathematicians actually reject computers being a part of a proof. Um, well, in this case, it was a very important part of his proof. And finally, when people weren't yet certifying that his proof was correct, he decided to take his proof, so a, an 80-page paper, and he, as, he kind of recruited an army of referees. So there were like 90 people that were asked to verify his paper. He just split his paper into like 90 pieces. Each piece was like a small computation. And then each person was supposed to verify that computation. And they were supposed to verify that it fit correctly with the other ones. And then finally, this army of referees certified that really uh, this, this theorem was, this proof was correct. Um, and after that, Cooperberg found a simpler proof, uh, kind of inspired by some of the ideas of Salzburg. Random question. What does, what does it mean for the computer to prove it? It's like, does it generate like the logical steps that have to be, that conclude that? Or? So, so this this WZ algorithm, the Wilf Salzburg algorithm, which I think is what what played a part here, is an algorithm that basically says, you know, if if, if I have an, a combinatorial identity, right, this combinatorial quantity equals this combinatorial quantity. And if, if the quantities are of a certain form, then they devised an algorithm that would take that and, and just generate a combinatorial proof. No, sorry, a, a computer proof. And so you know, there's an algorithm, and you need to learn about how it works. And so then you just feed this into the computer, and then the computer proves the, the identity, and it also gives you a certificate that it's proved. And so if you want to verify it, then you just take the certificate, and you just uh, check that. I mean, it, it tells you how you can check that the computer proof was correct. It's a, it's a very uh, beautiful topic that I, I don't have too much time to talk about it, and I'm also not an expert about it, but I'm happy to point you to, um, to the literature, literature on it. Um, but yeah, so you know, this was a beautiful proof, um, very intricate proof. And then Cooperberg found, it, found a much shorter proof that Actually, the, one of the key ideas I like a lot, and so I wanted to show it to you. And so I'm going to rotate the camera, and we're going to do something here now. Uh, okay. Another question about the computer proof. Mm -hmm. So it's not like, like you basically feed into it two expressions, and the computer will prove that they're equal or prove that they're not equal. Well, what did he plug in for the left side of the expression? Right, so I mean, it's it's not like you can ask the, the computer, oh, prove that the number of alternating side matrices is this. I mean, there, there's definitely a lot of mathematics involved in translating this into something that then a computer could could pick up. So I mean, there was already kind of a closed form? Or I mean, like, like I said, it, it is 80 pages of computations. It's, it's, you know, it's a lot of, it's a lot of ideas to get to reduce it to a point, I mean, uh, one thing that he's a master at is is reducing combinatorial problems into things that his his algorithms can do. 
and uh, it's, it's actually a fascinating paper. I really recommend that you look at it if only for curiosity. Uh, instead of numbering the equations, he, he has n names of people and uh, I don't know. It's, it's, it's funny and it's interesting and it's just, uh, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's kind of a, like it's, it's an interesting uh, kind of uh, historical piece of mathematics actually. I feel like now, now that computers are becoming more uh, important in a lot of mathematical proofs. He's, he's really one of the pioneers in this. Okay, so Cooperberg um, actually realized the following. So he realized that this could be reframed um, in the following. So he, so he, he carried out a bijection like this. So I'm gonna describe a bijection between alternating sign matrices and this, which doesn't feel like it belongs in a mathematics class, but today it does. Um, this is what's called the square ice model. You know what model means, you know what square means. Uh, and ice, well the idea is that actually these H's and O's really do represent hydrogen and, ox and oxygen. A water particle is one oxygen and two hydrogens. Um, and so the idea is that you have, and the idea is that because it's because it's at a low temperature, then it then you know, when when things get colder, they take rigid shapes like ice becomes cubical. Um, particles also line up into lattices like this. Um, and then the question is, given this array of hydrogens and ho and oxygens, how can they pair up? Right? Because they want to be water. Okay. And so, uh, Cooperberg gives a recipe to do that from here. So what he says is, whenever you see a one, pair up. So the, these guys are going to be the, they're going to correspond to the oxygens. I wish I had made the hydrogens of a different color so it would be a little bit clearer. But So whenever you see a one, then that oxygen is gonna pair up with the hydrogens to the left and to the right. Whenever you see a minus one, then that oxygen is going to pair up with the hydrogens and top and below. And whenever you see a zero, then the oxygen is going to pair up with like somebody, um, somebody vertical and somebody horizontal. So it might be like this, or it might be like this. So this rule is less rigid, these two are very rigid. Okay. So let's go ahead and do that um, <coughs> here, okay? So where is this one? This one corresponds to this oxygen right here. And so that oxygen is gonna pair up with the left and the right neighbors. Here I'm gonna need your help because you guys can see much better than me. I'm too close to the board, so make sure that I don't make any mistakes. So let's take this one, that one, Maps matches horizontally, so that's this guy, and it goes horizontally like this, right? Now this one corresponds to this guy, right? So like that's horizontal. Uh, then this one is this this guy, so that's horizontal. Uh, let's leave that minus one alone for now. This is a one, so. Horizontal. Now there's a one right here, and there's a one right here, right? Mm -hmm. So there's the horizontal water particles. Now the vertical ones are this minus one is this one, right? Yeah. So that guy pairs vertically. This minus one is this one. That's it, okay? And then the rest, I'm supposed to uh, put kind of curvy particles, okay? Yeah? Does every every row of the alternating sign matrix have to have at least one non-zero? Um, as well as zeros, then yeah. Like one of yeah, I guess I, sh I should have said actually that, that in every row and every column you do have to have at least a one. 
you can't have only zeros in, in a row or in a column. Okay, um, so now I'm supposed to do the, to do the rest. Okay, so let's let's try to see if we have some freedom or if this is forced. So do you see particles that are forced? So for example, this one is forced, right? So forced. Anybody else is forced? Corners. The corners. The corners, right? So this this guy forced that forces this one. That forces this one. That forces this one. Um, this, okay. This guy is forced. That forces this guy. This guy. Uh, over here, the, the corner has to go like this, and then this has to go like this, and then this has to go like this. Okay. The, uh, this guy has to go like this, and this oxygen has to pair up with these ones. So this oxygen has to pair up with these ones. This one has to pair up with these ones. This one has to pair up. That's it. And Did that work? Yeah, it worked. Yeah. Wow, that's cool. <laughs> uh, so here's, here's the theorem. The theorem is that this is a bijection. Um, once you lay down the horizontal particles and the vertical particles, then the rest can be filled, and it can be filled in a unique way. Okay? And so you get uh, a configuration in the square i's north. Um, and then, basically, that, uh, that allowed Cooperberg to, to kind of frame this into things that were more familiar in the statistical physics literature, statistical mechanics. Um, and, it, I mean, in the end, it does come down to evaluating determinants and things like this. Um, so it has a similar flavor, but it, uh, it also brings in this stuff that I think is really cool. Um, and by the way, this, this is, I mean, a lot of what statistical mechanics people do is this kind of combinatorics, actually. Um, OK. I, uh, but I should say, I mean, th there's really a long way to go from here. It's not like from here you can very easily see this is true. And in fact, one, one thing that I, that I want to make clear to you. Yeah? So the, the question is why, <laughs> the question is what these things have to do with each other, right? This seems so strange. So for example, wh what is it that makes, I mean, for some reason, the fact that you have these alternating ones and negative ones is what allows this to work. Why, I, I'm afraid I don't really have a great intuition for it. Um, I think I have had a better intuition. I mean, at some point I thought about this more seriously and I. I feel like I, I used to understand this, this bijection. Actually, I used to understand this bijection very well, but I haven't thought about it in years. So, and I should say, actually, I told you in your homework there's a missing part, and that part is going to be this. So you're going to play with this, and when you play with it, then I, I think you'll get to understand a little bit better why, why it works. Yeah? What do you mean? In terms of the bijection of this alternating matrix and the chemistry of this thing? Mm -hmm. oh. oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, the, the point is that yeah, it's just it's just very unclear why these are the right conditions, so that so that this uh, arrangement would work out, and they happen to be exactly the right conditions. So it's a bit mysterious. Um, like all of these things, it's mysterious until you think about it really hard, and then it it becomes kind of clearer probably at some point. Yeah. There's no uh, bijection between the alternating sign matrices and plane partition. So that's that's what I was going to write actually. So here's some open problems that are very intriguing. Bijective proofs of any of this. Bijective proof of, uh, what is it? Totally symmetric self-complementary plane partition equals alternating sign matrices or equals this product. What do we have? We have this triple equality. It's all proved, but none of these proofs are bijective. And, uh, and so it would be nice to get better explanations. Uh, one of the problems that I listed in the list of open projects was this bijection between 
Gog triangles and Magog triangles. And at that point, probably you had no idea what this was about. But the thing is that, I forget which is which, but maybe Gog triangles are in by direction with this, and Magog triangles are in by direction with this. And so then the, the, the idea is that maybe there should be a nice bijection between these objects. Um, anyway, so that's that. Uh, wide open stuff, very interesting. And what I, what I want to describe to you now for the rest of the hour is how it is that these guys ran into uh, these conjectures, or these objects. put an X here so that I remember that if I draw here, I should move the camera. Okay. So where does this come from? Actually, um, <coughs> that also has a very interesting uh, story. So a lot of people know, okay, almost everybody in the West has read uh, Lewis Carroll uh, in school at some point, uh, Alice in Wonderland. And a lot of people know that Lewis Carroll was a mathematician. Actually, uh, Lewis Carroll, uh, his real name was actually Charles Dodgson. And uh, people often talk about how he's a mathematician, but people never, almost never talk about his mathematics. And so I'm going to show you a, a theorem of Lewis Carroll. Of Dodgson concentration. What? Condensation. Uh, so this is a fast method to compute the terminus. Okay, so let's say that you want to compute a determinant like Well, I mean, if it's a three by three determinant, that doesn't, that's not hard, right? You go three, three that way, three that way. Um, but the, the trouble is that if you want to compute an, an m by n determinant, there's m factorial terms. And m factorial grows much faster than exponential, which means that the, from the definition, you cannot really compute determinants efficiently. And so he devised this very beautiful method that goes like this. So supposed to make a pyramid of numbers. Let's see, what's a good way to draw this? Let me... make a pyramid that has four levels. Okay. And so what I'm going to do is that in this level I'm going to write the matrix that I'm trying to compute. Okay, so 1, minus 1, 1, 2, 2, 1, minus 1, 1, 3. Okay, 3 by 3. Now this is a 4 by 4 square and I'm going to just write 1's everywhere. Okay, so you can imagine you have a 4x4 four four table, and on top of it, you have a 3x3 three three table. Okay? So now, this is going to be a 2x2 two two table, and to compute these numbers, what are you going to do? Well, the, the rule is the following, that whenever you have a 2x2 two two square like this, okay, let's say these numbers are, I don't know, A, B, C, and D, then how, how are you going to compute the number that goes right here? Imagine that 
Uh, right, right at the, right in the center of A, B, C, and D, there is an entry that goes over here in the next table, and there's an entry that goes over here in the previous table, right behind it. So if I called these numbers E and F, then the formula for computing F is that it's AD minus BC over E. Okay? This should sound like black magic to you, but uh, anyway, this is this is what we're gonna do. So for example, what's this entry right here? So this, this entry, the, the top left entry, is sitting right above this square with the one, the minus one, the two, and the two. So I go one times two minus minus one times two, that's four, and I divide by the number below, which is this one. So one. So I get a four. Okay. And this guy, you go minus one, minus two. So I get minus three. This one I get two minus minus two. So I get four. And then two times three minus one times one is four. Three. <laughs> Not supposed to be making sticks. Five. Okay. okay, well that's a two by two table. Now what is this? This is a one by one table. So what I'm supposed to do is take four times five is twenty minus minus three times four. So minus minus twelve. So twenty plus twelve is thirty two. But don't forget you're supposed to divide by the floor below, right? The number in the floor below is this one. So 32 divided by 2 is 16. Okay. And that's it. So this is uh, Dodgson's theorem. Really interesting method for computing determinants. And it is fast in the sense that actually these computations are all very quick. And there's only n levels. And in each level, you only do like n squared operations. So it takes about n cubed operations instead of n factorial. That's, that's much better. OK, so this is Dodgson's condens condensation. Um, now, basically what, uh, so what we're going to do is analyze this a little bit further, actually a lot further. Okay? So let me leave this here. I'm going to make a little bit of room over here. Um, So let's, let's uh, think about how this goes. So let me now plan this so I can write it a little bit more easily. One, 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 one. This is the first level, right? Now, the next level, actually, is instead of computing this one, let's just put a nonce, OK? Um, so x11, one, one, x12. One, x13, x21, x22, x23, x31, x32, x33. Okay. Then in the next level, what do I get? I get this times this minus this times this. Then I get this. Let me write it and see if it fits or not. Okay, just squeeze it a little bit. Okay. Now again, I'm dividing by one here, so so that's why I don't get any denominators here. Okay, so that's that's the two by two array that I get. Okay, and then in the final step, I take this thing and I do what I do. X one one, 
x2, 2, minus x1, 2, x2, 1. So I'm going to need more room than this. Mm -hmm. I get this minus this one times this one, right? Yeah. Divided by x2. Now, you know what, actually, it's, it is useful to, to write it out, so I'm going to have to move the camera, but that's fine. So, okay, so that's my determinant. Is it? Is that correct? You guys know what the determinant looks like. How many turns do I have here? Yeah, that's right. I have 2 times 2 is 4, 2 times 2 is another 4, so I get I get 8 turns. Okay, but the, the determinant is supposed to only have 6 terms. So why do I have 8? Well, let's look at one of the terms. So I chose one here that was kind of nice, which is choosing um, this one. Let's look at the term that, that comes from multiplying this times this over this. OK, this is x1, 2, x2, 1, x2, 2, x2 3, x3, 2 divided by x2. That comes with a plus sign, right? So actually, I claim that that term gets canceled out. And it gets canceled out with, I guess, this times this, which is a minus. So those get canceled out. And then I get six terms that are the real determinant. So that proves it, at least in this 3 by 3 case. But let's look at this thing a little bit more closely, because uh, something interesting is going to happen. What if we make a little matrix here? And just say what very what which ones appear here? X one, two, uh, so this is a three by three table, right? X one, two appears. X two, one appears, X two, three appears, X three, two appears. And next 2, 2 appears, and it appears in the denominator. The exponent is minus 1. And the rest are 0. Okay. So I get an alternating sign matrix. And, so, and what, uh, what these guys observed, uh, Robbins, Rumsey, and I keep forgetting. Um, what's that? Mills, thank you. <laughs> Mills, Robin, and Rumsey observed that what you get here are exactly uh, I get eight terms like this, and they correspond precisely to the alternating sign matrices. Exactly. Okay. Now you might say, well, that's a little bit weird because you told me the number of alternating sign matrices was a product. So how is it that they correspond to the alternating sign matrices if there's two to the n of them? Well, the reason is that, as we just discussed, if I look at, so this was my red monomial, right? But um, I said that if I looked at this term, this guy, times this guy, which one? This one. Then I get the same one. which means that I might get the same alternating sign matrix several times. And actually, each alternating sign matrix appears 2 to the number of minus 1 times. So 
So this alternate design matrix has a minus one. And so we expect it to appear twice, the red term and the green term. Okay. The other alternate design matrices that are three by three are just the six permutation matrix. They don't have any minus one. Each one appears once, and they precisely give the determinant, right? The determinant is precisely the permutation matrix. Okay. And so this is how they discovered alternating sign matrices, just by trying to analyze Dodgson condensation. Uh, and then, yeah, they just wondered, well, you know, what if I count them? And they found this beautiful formula. Okay. And then it all got more and more exciting from there. Okay. Actually, this gets even more exciting. Because one, one thing that you can try to do is that you can try to say, well, you know, maybe I'm not fully satisfied with the fact that um, I get repeated terms. Maybe I want different terms. I want them all to be different. And so one way of pulling that off is going to be that instead of putting ones here, I mean, in the Dodgson method, you're supposed to put ones in the, in, the, in the bottom of the pyramid. But I'm just going to put variables here also. I'm going to put y variables. And then at the end, I can always plug in y equals 1. Okay. But let's see what happens when I put y's here. Okay. So instead of 1's in the bottom, I'm going to put now y11. Y12, Y13, Y14, etc. And I carry out the same computation. Okay? So if I, if I carry out the same computation, what happens? Well, I just have to put these new terms where they where I didn't have them, right? So, for example, okay, this is the same. Now here, I'm supposed to do this times this minus this times this and divide by one over there. Which one should I divide by? You have to imagine that this three by three table, you're overlaying on top of this four by four table. So who lands here? Y22, right? So I'm supposed to divide by Y22. And similarly, I'm supposed to divide by y23 here, I'm supposed to divide by y32 here, and I'm supposed to divide by y33. Okay? So that doesn't change things too much, um, but it does change them a little bit. So let's introduce those guys here. So here, this is divided by y22, this is divided by y33, this is divided by y23, this is divided by y32, right? But again, I'm supposed to do this times this, minus this times this, and divide by x22. Okay, so I erased it, let's not forget to put it back. Get that. Okay? So one advantage of this is that by introducing these extra variables, I'm going to separate the red term from the green term. Because what does the red term look like now? Well, the red term picked up these denominators y22 and y33. Right? So y22, y33. Those are new. And then I still have my old x22. Okay. And now let me take the green out of here because the green is different now. So the green term has the same x stuff. But it has different y stuff, right? It has y23. So when I introduce y's, uh, 
this changes. Now let's think about exactly how it changes. You have a question or a comment um, to it? Yeah, if, if you don't mind going back to when you were talking about the number of negative ones that appear. Mm -hmm. So uh, you were saying that the when a term appears only once over here, you're saying that there are no negative ones in the ASM, right? When a term appears only once in this multiplication, yeah. that means that there are no negative ones in the alternating sign matrix. I'm having, what would be an alternating sign matrix that had no negative ones? So the alternating sign matrices that don't have negative ones are all permutation matrices like this. Oh, okay. And, uh, and they're precisely the expressions that you want in the determinant. Okay, now if we had a nice bijection between terms and alternating sign matrices, we should probably do the same thing with the blue stuff and see what we get. So where do you think I should put these guys? In this picture. See a pointing maybe two where they would land on the matrix, right? Like y to two, y three, three, and they would land here, and here. And these guys are not y two. Here I get something different. So again the black stuff is the same. But the blue stuff is different. So blue stuff now is y23 and y32. Okay. So you see, yeah, so now, now I get these different things. So now I claim that the terms correspond to what? Well now, they don't just correspond to an ASM because there's a black stuff and a blue stuff. I claim that they correspond to pairs of compatible of a black ASM of size n and a blue ASM of size n minus one, which are compatible in some way. I'm going to put this in quotations because I am being vague on purpose about what being compatible means. But the point is that if you look at the blue things, well, <coughs> it's hard to see in this small example that this is interesting in any way. But the blue things are also an alternating sign matrix when you, when you change the signs. And this always happens. This is not an accident. Even in much bigger terms, this, this always happens. Okay. And so, this is a sum of how many monomials? Um, sum of monomials. Right. Uh, let me write, because these are called Laurent. So they're monomials where you might have things in the denominator. That's why they're called Laurent monomials. Okay. So the, the, the fact is that, that when, you, when you carry out the computation, the result is a sum of Laurent monomials corresponding to combinatorial things like this, a black ASM and a blue ASM that are on top of each other. Now, th there is one thing that I want to point out to you, which is that already what I'm saying should be very, very, very surprising to you. I mean, for, for many reasons. But one reason is that why on earth should this be a sum of monomials? Now, this is a little bit hard to appreciate at this point because we've only divided by uh, single things. But imagine what happens in the next step. Right? 
if, if this was one bigger, then in the next step, you would have to divide by this. And when you divide by this, there's no reason that you should get a monomial, that you should get monomials. And it ends up happening that when you divide some huge thing by this, that huge thing ends up being a multiple of this. It's the only way that that could happen, is that you need to cancel this out. And okay, maybe it's not so impressive to be a multiple of this thing, but in the next step, you need to be a multiple of this guy that has six terms, and in the next step, you have to be a multiple of somebody that has 24 terms. And there's really a lot of magical cancellation going on. Okay. So, already the fact that you get monomials is very remarkable, and the fact that you get these ones is just more amazing. Um, okay, but now I want to show you something even cooler. which is the following. Uh, let's see if I can... Okay, I can erase all of this stuff. Let me take... This thing, and now draw it a little bit different. So these dots are going to be my black entries from there. Take each term in this expression. Okay? And now what I'm going to do is, it's going to seem very arbitrary, I'm going to add 3 to each entry. So I'm taking each one of these pictures, and I'm going to add 3 to each entry. So I get 3, 4, 3, 4, 2, 4, 3, 4, 3. Okay. Let's do maybe the one on the left. Okay, forget about this one. So let's not forget about these guys. Okay, so I get three, two, two, three. Okay, and now I'm going to do the following. Um, now replace each number i with i edges going northeast, northwest, southeast, or southwest. So what does that mean? It means that if you see a 4, then you're forced to send 4 edges out like that. Okay? If you see a a three, then you only get to draw three of them. And if you see a two, then you have to, uh, you, you, you get to uh, draw two edges coming out of it. Okay? So let's carry that out and see what we get. Now, and these things are rigid, these things are forced, so maybe we should do the force first. Okay? So this four, I need to take four things that come out. Okay. This four has I meant for this to be a grid. Okay. Four things come out of it. Um, this 
4 has four edges coming out. And this 4 has four edges coming out. Okay. What should I do next? Well, you see, this guy already has two edges. So I cannot draw this one, and I cannot draw this one. So therefore, because this guy is supposed to have three edges, but I cannot draw this one, I have to draw this, I have to draw this, I have to draw this. Here, this guy needs two edges, but this one I cannot use. And for the same reason, this one I cannot use, because this guy already has two. So I have to go like this. What about this one again? I cannot use this edge, so I need to go with three. One, two, and three. Okay. What about this one? Well, this guy already has his three edges. So this edge is not there, which means that I have to draw this one, this one, and this one. And this guy, it already this guy already has three edges, so the three must be this one, this one, this one. You see what I get? If you tilt your head, what I get is exactly a domino tiling of the Aztec or Mayan diamond. When I do this, I get a domino tiling. So, I mean, not, not only that, what I should say is that. Dodge some condensation produces where determinant is equal to the sum over tilings over the dominant tilings diamond of whatever the exponents are, right? So you have to kind of reverse engineer this thing. You draw the Aztec diamond, you draw the tiling. From the tiling, how do you get the numbers? The, the numbers are just counting the degrees of the, of the vertices, right? So, so you, you take the, the tiling, you count the degrees of the vertices, and then you, you just make this kind of x to the degrees of the vertices. So this is like a vector x to the degree of the tiling. Where by x, x to the degree of the tiling, what I mean is, is this, right? You, you take the tiling, you take your numbers of the degrees, you subtract three to them, and you get this one number. And so that, I mean, I think it's I think it's very unlikely that that Lewis Carroll knew all of this, but this is all hiding behind uh, his method. So really, uh, dodge some condensation um, is actually has in it embedded the problem of counting the tilings of elastic time of my time. And so. Uh, Corollary. Yeah. How do we get negatives here? Aren't we? I'm sorry. Well, over. Well, I guess I, I should do. I should always do minus three. No, that not that minus three. The um. In the determinant. Oh. We have some subtraction. Thank you. So I, I there is a there is a sign in front of each type. Okay. Yeah. And I'm not telling you. How to get it, but there is there is some coming up okay. a recipe for, for how to get it. Okay. Um, corollary. The Mayan diamond has this number of tiles. We we talked about this, and here's 
and dodge some condensation proof of this fact. Proof. Um, look at dodge some condensation after 10 steps. So this guy, I don't know, let's say that this is step n plus 1. And so that means that I get a little pyramid like this. Where I call this A, B, C, D, E, and F. So we have the equation that E times F equals A times B minus B times C. Okay. But each one of these terms is carrying a bunch of tilings of elastic diamonds, of Mayan diamonds, in it. In the first level, you have the Mayan diamonds of, of size 0. In the next level, you have the Mayan diamonds of size 1, then size 2. And then in the level n, you get the ones of size n. So, how many terms are there? The number of terms in this is what? Well, E is, the number of terms here is the number of tilings of the diamond of size n minus 1. This, this, this terms correspond to the tilings of size n minus 1. This corresponds to the tilings of size n plus 1. So when I multiply monomials and monomials, the number of terms is this times this. Now, this guy encodes dominant tilings of the guy of size n. This guy also, when I multiply them, you can check there's no cancellation, so you get all these different terms. And then this guy also produces the same number of terms. When you multiply all of this out, you get all terms that are different. So you get this stuff. So I get 2 mn squared. So that means that mn plus 1 over mn is equal to 2 mn over mn. I guess I should say that you know this is mn, right? The number of times. Um, so I, wrote the, I rewrite this equation like this, and now I get, okay, well, if mn plus 1 over mn is 2 times mn over mn minus 1, that means that the ratio from mn to the previous one doubles each time. And so what you get is that mn over mn minus 1 is 2 to the n. It doubles each time. And you can see the first ratio is 1, so then the ratio goes 1, 2, etc. Okay. So that means that the quotient from one, the number of tilings of the nth one to the previous one is 2 to the n. So to get mn, I take 2 to the n, then I multiply by mn minus 1 over mn minus 2 is 2 to the n minus 1, so on. Zero. So that, that proves that the Mayan diamond has this number of dominant diamonds. I think this is a really beautiful proof. And of course, maybe now you can see why I didn't want to prove these things for you. I mean, there's really a lot of details that I'm not talking about here. Uh, but I think more than, more than the exact details of the proofs, I just wanted to, to give you a, a feeling for, for how this works, how there's this very beautiful theory behind um, all of this stuff. Um, let me just conclude by, by, by making one remark, which is that I was talking about how you have this, we have this recurrence that is rational, right? It's not a linear recurrence, it's not a polynomial recurrence, it's a, it's a rational recurrence, where each thing is given in terms of rational functions of the previous things. And we talked about how when you, when you carry out the, this recurrence, it's absolutely magical that the answer should be monomials. 
it is really not at all expected a priori. Um, so I, I just wanted to tell you that this is one phenomenon of a very large theory that is very exciting to people right now, which is the theory of cluster algebras. Actually, the seminar next week is about cluster algebras, now that I think about it. So it's this very, very general theory that explains a lot of phenomena like this. When you have a, a rational recurrence like this, but actually turns out to produce uh, integers or polynomials when it doesn't look like it, like it should. Okay. Uh, so this is a really beautiful theory that, that I would encourage you to look into. Um, to conclude, the, the last thing that I, that I wanted to do is show you something else remarkable about this, which is that imagine that you, that you had this experiment, that you took all the tilings of a Mayan diamond of size n, you put them all in a bag, and then you just pick one at random. What do you see? It's kind of hard to say. So I was part of this research group, and this was actually my first math research project when I was a freshman. And we, we carried out these experiments, and we produced this program that produced random tilings of shapes like this one. Uh, and maybe what I'll do is I'm going to show you the picture. I'm going to show the camera the picture, and then I'll pass this around. So I don't know what the best way to do this is. Let's try this out. Ugh, does that show? No, maybe not. <laughs> Maybe I'll also post, post this on the forum so you can look at it more carefully. But the point is that you'll see that there's an amazing structure that you wouldn't expect. So you see that this tiling is frozen around the corners and then there's a very irregular shape in the interior in the shape of a circle. So I'll pass this around. Maybe I'll draw a little sketch. So when you, when you take a random tiling, what you find is that near the border, all the tiles are, li are lined up like, like brickwork, almost like ice. These are all horizontal, horizontal, horizontal. And then over here, they become vertical, 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 even horizontal, horizontal, and then vertical, vertical. So around the corner, they look like ice, and, you, and you'll see that. Very regular. And in the interior, they look more like gas, actually. In the interior, it's a mess, right here. In interior, you, you won't be able to discern any shape. And there's this theorem called the Arctic Circle Theorem, which is the, the goal of that paper, um, that proves that actually, as the diamond gets bigger, this shape becomes a circle. So that outside of the circle, the tiling is perfectly frozen. Inside of the circle, it's a mess. So what did you say? Connected to this? So what, what I'm saying is that when, when you look at a random tiling of the Aztec diamond, just pick one out at random, it, it, it has this very strange behavior that you wouldn't expect. So it's part of a beautiful theory that uh, it's much bigger than we can cover in the class. But anyway, that's, that's it. So that's all we're going to talk about, tilings, determinants, etc. And uh, starting next week, we're going to, starting next class, we're going to switch topics again. But I, what I did was very small, a very small part of that. I just helped write the program that, that generated the tidings, but but the theorems are very, they're much harder. <laughs>